Thank you, Seaman. Early in September 1965, half a century ago, our family was living in Beijing uh, in a sort of a, a Puritan life. And my, in my first school class, uh, I was told to be a good boy in order to emancipate the rest of the world in dire straits. But now today, we are standing here to talk about asking people to be a good citizen. I think it's all about asking people to be good. Uh, there's a Chinese saying that goes like this, a long journey starts with the first step. I fully agree, and there is no mystery that the spirit of uh, today's global citizenship has to be born as a citizenship of certain given countries. The challenge is citizenship is generally understood as a Western concept. So people of my age in China would have gone through quite a few very different stage, stages. First of all, the influence of our own traditional Chinese ethics. And then socialism in the 60s and 70s. But I, I see some ch Chinese audience. And then after 80s, we have the socialism of the Chinese style. And then we have globalization, and then we have uh, westernization. All come at once. So how is citizenship be born under such a mixed environment. Traditional Chinese ethics talk about harmony, benevolence, and virtue. And uh, socialism in the 60s and 70s talk about egalitarianism and self-sacrifice. And all of a sudden here today we talk about individual participation in global affairs. What a mess and what a big jump too. So we better, we better leave this to social philosophers to study this. But I'm going to lead you through my own journey of self-cultivation and to see that how seeds of the traditional Chinese moral virtues could be cultivated and grown into a global citizenship, citizen. As far as I could remember, there was no such a decisive moment that suddenly changed my course. I believe my own moralization is more of an uh, indoctrination process. And, uh, but, but, but both indoctrin indoctrination and enlightenment leads to uh, belief in morality. Life was so simple and easy and plain for us in the 60s, and it's so egalitarian. Everything was almost rationed. So I was never starving, but I could never remember of feeling full. In my childhood memory, both radios and newspapers kept singing the praises of all these revolutionary moral figures for their meritorious deed. And uh, people seem to be few and willing to help. Despite of all this tight economic situation, I never heard of anyone's belongings being stolen. At the same time, like many thousand years, the traditional Chinese wisdoms and virtues was quietly passed on to the next generation through parents repeatedly talking about, telling all these proverbs and encouraging moral practices. My mother obviously was one of them. Uh, among all the idioms, idiom stories, I think this one oh, must be the most typical in China, that there is an eye in the sky watching you. So kid, be good, don't lie. You know, most of the Chinese mothers were not religious, right? And, uh, for a kid, such a fabrication of an eye on the sky, I would say almost play the role of reverence for the God. So what a great white lie for uh, people to behave good. And to be good, a kid also needs a role model. Like millions of Chinese children at that time, I followed Chairman Mao's call for learning from Lei Feng. I think it, 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 he's, a, he's a longevity uh, moral figures in China, uh, icons in China. But I think the key thing is that the model of Lei Feng has demonstrated a very important part of a moral practice that you don't need to be uh, doing extraordinary things to be a moral hero. And the moral hero just could be around the corner. And if you want to be one, just keep doing it. Um, keep accumulating all this trivial moral uh, or trivial goodness. I studied humble with all the small things like uh, 
mail deliveries of being honest and uh, setting births free and uh, was simply greeting odd adults from returning from work. Yes, of course, I was expecting and enjoying uh, some recognitions like phrases. Is that too utilitarian, utilitarianism? Maybe, but what would you expect from a kid, right, at that time? But with me growing up, my moral practice had extended into new frontiers. Uh, in 1972, I started donating some money, some money to my poor schoolmates uh, in the middle school to top up his annual uh, tuition fee. Five RMB was not a small amount at that time. It was almost like my pocket money for five months. And in 1974, yeah, this, this was me, uh, I organized a few uh, volunteer missions to uh, a few villages north of Beijing. And it was through these trips that I really learned the hard reality of China, and particularly the rural poverty. In 1978, I came to Zhejiang University, but I brought my bike with me. So I started an experiment called Free to Ride. And uh, it was a similar concept to the carpool in Europe. Remember, the, uh, start from Holland, uh, Germany, and, uh, and De De Denmark. But I was 20 years ahead of them. Right? And uh, a bicycle was a quite luxury thing at that time in China. But, with, but also with me growing up, I realized that a lot of people gave up of this practice. Then I noticed there's a fear that the heroes always la finish last. That means uh, the bad coins drives out the, the good ones. Later on, I also learned that the good guys can be also very lonely because for most of the things they have done, maybe there's never a chance for them to be recognized. In a flash of time, half a century has passed. The world around me has changed a lot, but none of this uh, has changed my determination to go on with my own course of moral cultivation. I do it willingly today because it's becoming my faith. It is more of a matter between myself and with my faith, and less to do with what other people think and, th think and say. Leave the role models and moral indoctrination aside. The question is why some people are still motivated to continue with their own uh, moral practices when there is a general perception that the heroes finish at last. I think the answer has to be one, that the virtue itself is re its own re reward. And I remember there was a scavenger I helped a little bit just once uh, many years ago. And later on, he was employed by our community management company to do the same thing, cleaning. Uh, but every time we encountered each other, he really would greet me always like a friend, always. Very, very moving. And back to my free bike store on this campus. And can you believe it is still talked about after 37 years in the alumni chat room? That's a nice thing to have, right? So nothing better captures this essence of virtue is its own reward than this motto by Mr. Chen Daoming. But for the Chinese citizen, probably you know who Chen Daoming is, a very respected Chinese uh, actor. He's also my role model. It goes like this. Cultivation comes with certain innate qualities and efforts to accumulate. Material and mental indulgences are simple, but the hard part is to, joy, is to find joy in moderation, which is the path to ascend to a higher realm of life. When it comes to citizenship, some people do little. We think they could, they could have done quite easily, but they complain a lot of things that is really beyond their reach. And as the Chinese saying goes, it's actually called a half effort, double the effects. My point is, why don't we stop complaining? Stop from ourselves, stop from our family, but start from our family, start uh, with uh, our, our, uh, ourselves. And uh, if you happen to run a business, we can start from our own company, start from our own staff, and start probably uh, from our supplier. It is a lot easier than complaining the government, the country, or think that is beyond your control. And this leads to the topic of globalization, a global citizenship for the business world. Unfortunately, today, there are far too many companies on one hand uh, running sweatshops, exploiting child labor, uh, polluting the environment, and probably evading the tax. But more embarrassingly, on the other hand, all of a sudden, this guy 
would all of a sudden donate some money to a school in Tibet and uh, plant some trees in, in Inner Mongolia and put this is typical behavior and put up solar panels uh, on their roof and they, they really just regard CSR as their own marketing gimmicks. I don't believe in split personality between private and business life. Most rules applied for citizenship for individuals also apply to business. But there is one big difference. With greater power comes with greater responsibility. The point is a single vicious act by business world can do so much damage than thousands of millions of households. Likewise, likewise, a responsible action by a single company can also do a lot of much greater effect than individuals could do. In 2003, we found this company called Greatview, a SAFI company, uh, myself with other five founding fathers. I think it's a dream team of uh, high integrity and also highly motivated people. And this is what we have achieved in, uh, in this less than 12 years. Seven years ago, our company was listed in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, which is regarded as a commercial success. And 10 years later, we have established our first uh, greenfield manufacturing site in Germany, operating. And now, after 12 years, our company in our industry is becoming number two in China and number three in the world. And uh, not only that, with production facilities and operating companies, both in China and in the EU, we are becoming the first multi Chinese multinational companies in the area of packaging. Also, we have really disturbed deeply a half century long monopoly structure in our industry. And we have led, uh, this has led to a lot of benefits to the downstream industry and also consumers. But apart from a commercial success, I'm also very proud that our company has also scored very high in the area of CSR and comp uh, corporate governance. In our industry, we use a lot of wood fibers because it's a paper industry. So the percentage of wood fiber certified like uh, FSC or PFC is a critical component, is actually the most important component of a CSR for our industry. And, uh, and this is to guarantee that uh, all these fibers are coming from sustainably uh, managed forests. Up to now, 75% 70%, of all the fiber we source globally are from uh, are certified, and 100% of the fibers that we use for our German factory is is uh, certified, and this 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 allows us to have a you know we, we really outbeat our competitor by a big margin European competitor, and led us to be a number one undistributed uh, undistributed number one, and uh, but this single action alone, uh, roughly at least we would have up to one million grown-up trees being protected. Uh, and such an uh, effect done by a company, just a company, not a big company, we're a medium-sized company, really goes far beyond uh, individual actives can do. So I think the company is a, plays a big role in this. The second thing I would like to share with you is uh, carbon footprint. Everybody talks about carbon footprint, carbon, but if, I, if people don't even know where they're coming from for your own company and how big they are, where do you start? So before while we are building our Inno Mongolian factory, we decided to do an audit. And then after the audit, we realized, whoa, it's like this. So we didn't stop there. We continued by neutralizing the CO2. But instead of writing a check, most of the company would do this to an NGO. We have mobilized our staff to plant trees equivalent to about 60% of the job because we see this a critical and very rare opportunity to get our own staff involved and educated. And not surprisingly, uh, in the area of corporate governance, a few months ago, there's a famous, international, there's a famous uh, investment bank in Macquarie. If people are in the financial industry, you probably know who Macquarie is. Uh, published a survey about uh, all public listed companies in Asia Pacific, small and medium cap, were included about this CSR and also corporate governance. And our company ranked number five in all this report and number one for China. I'd like to emphasize all this happened, all this CSR thing happened without struggling and stretching the company much. I think once the company or the owner or the entrepreneur were morally ready, everything falls into place naturally. 
wait a minute. Did we talk about heroes always finish at last? That bad coins always try about the good ones? I think differently now. I think companies with a good citizenship are rare and scarce. Wouldn't they enjoy a competitive advantage? So I would like to, so I would like to argue for the contrary that not only good guys enjoy being good, the good guy in real turn may, may well be better off in the long run. Both my own story and the case of my own company are just good examples of how societies, regardless of colors, cultural, and political backgrounds, all have progressive elements that would blend very well with the concept of global citizenship. So at the end of my speech, I'd like to call for more people from developing country to showcase your leadership in global citizenship. The going is tough, the tough gets going. I would also like to draw attention of the entrepreneurs from developing country that despite of all the difficulties, we hold the key to solving them only by acting as global citizens together. I also want to assure these people that the case of our company is very clear that being a global citizenship not only makes you feeling better, it also probably makes very good economic sense. Come on and join us. Thank you very much.